cloud, share screen. Got it. Share screen. Okay. Man, these floating, my, my life is destroyed by the floating bars on Zoom. All right, everybody can see this okay? Yeah, okay, great. All right, so I'm gonna run through some sort of general stats remembrances kind of thing for you guys. Um, uh, uh, hopefully this stuff doesn't sound new. Maybe you've just sort of forgotten it from way back when, but hopefully this just jars some ideas um, back in your head. And as always, you guys can interrupt me and, uh, and, and ask me to explain something that doesn't make sense. So let's talk a little bit about, about sort of very broad sense statistics. Um, so uh, we were also talking about uh, uh, figures and um, uh, representations of data. So here we have, this is a figure from this week. This is about, um, uh, or we just published this week, but, it, but uh, they didn't update the most recent data set, but it was in an article from this week. Um, but this is an example of, uh, you know, interest in the Olympics. This is the kind of figure maybe some of you might be thinking about um, generating, right? We have treatment one, treatment two, or, or yes, no, or something of that nature. And then some grouping, a question or a year, another question or a year, et cetera. And, uh, and we have, have this out here, right? So this is, um, this is not uh, wrong, quote unquote, but this is maybe not the most uh, efficacious way to communicate some of the stuff, but this is the kind of thing we're talking about, right? And so the question would be, hey, so is, is this, is blue really different from orange here? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Is blue really different from orange here? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You guys are currently generating your, your figures, your, your, your um, visualizations of your data, and that's going to help guide you um, in terms of some of the choices you make in terms of the quantitative analyses that you'll, that you'll take as, as far as the hypothesis, hypotheses that you will attempt to test and how you'll construct the statistics to uh, execute those tests. Um, and so, so the first thing is like this, even though this is maybe not the most perfect graph, great, great first graph, something like this. Give me a sense. Okay, I, I get a sense that the 2000 is like this, the 2008 is like that, and so on and so forth. Uh, here's perhaps another type of figure that some of you might be uh, generating. So again, keeping with the Olympic theme here of, of, uh, of the, uh, I don't know, whatever, blah, 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 Olympiad we are. I, I don't remember which number we are right now, um, right? And so this kind of thing. So in this case, these, this visualization is meant to show how many medals different countries win or have won over time, starting with back in the day up to now. Uh, and they've used a stacked bar graph. So they're showing the gold medals, the silver medals, and the bronze medals. By the height of all three combined uh, bars represents the total number of Olympic medals that that country uh, has been awarded. And then oh, you- that Germany, who knew? Yeah, yeah, there you go. So again, as a first step, great, right? This is, this is a nice kind of first step and help me understand. Maybe this is a figure that you wanna keep in your, in your um, poster or your-, your um, thesis. Um, but have a look. Uh, you know, so, so just, it's pretty easy, I think, for us to eyeball this and say, ah, Russia is getting way more stuff now than they did back in the day when, when they were called Soviet Union, so they didn't exist back then. But we use a different example. Canada is getting more, more medals now than maybe, you know, back in the day. I think that's, that's a probably pretty safe conclusion, right? But what if we said something like, hey, has Germany's amount of bronze medals uh, they, they changed over the last several years of Olympics? That's hard to see, right? Our visualization should not only just simply present the data, but it should present the data in a meaningful way. And so if one of your key comparisons uh, was to highlight the bronze, you know, the, this, the, these bars segments, if that was, that was key to your argument or your, your, your inquiry, this is not the best way to do that. Why? Because I have to, I'm kind of like eyeballing this, I'm like, well, it's about that big. And is that as big as that? I guess that's about as big, right? You're ma we're making our viewer do the work. So again, introductory overview type of figure, great. But um, maybe that'll work, maybe that won't. Um, and so that would be something as we start to revise and look at that, that's what you should be asking. And that's what you and your your reviewers, or when you're looking at your, your fellow students' figures to give them feedback, that's the kind of feedback you should give them. 
hey, I couldn't, I could tell that there was more medals, that Germany got more medals now than back in the day, but I couldn't really tell if the number of bronze changed that much. Okay, so uh, real quickly, statistics is the power to rationally evaluate the world. Um, here's a quote uh, from uh, uh, those of you that are coming with us to New Orleans this year, right? We'll talk about this uh, soon, but, but here's a quote. My next guest tonight is making, this is a real quote. My next guest tonight is making some remarkable assertions about the causes of our recent violent weather. He says, we face the man-made threat of terrorist hurricanes. He says, Katrina, for example, was created by the Japanese mafia using Russian-made technology, right? So that was on CNN in 2005. Uh, I guarantee uh, it was, Hurricane Katrina did not come from a uh, Russian-made Japanese mafia uh, attack on the U.S. But statistics are something that helps us can help us evaluate these kind of things. How likely is that to have happened, for example? Uh, and so statistics, in, in a nutshell, says, um, given what I have in my hand, so let's say we have a bag here, and I have some marbles, I have some marbles in my hand. Uh, statistics is going to say, I put my hand in that bag, pulled out some marbles, Given what's in my hand, statistics help us understand or make a prediction about what else is in the bag, right? So I grabbed out, I got a, got a striped marble, I got a solid white marble, I got a solid black marble, okay? Probability is the reverse of that, right? The flip side of that. So probability says, hey, if I know what, how many, you know, the, the, the different number of marbles in that bag, and I put my hand and I pulled four out and I kept my hand closed, probability will help me um, predict what's gonna be in my hand. So again, just flip side of the same uh, coin. And so we can literally flip a coin. So let's flip that coin. Wow, look at that very high powered animation. I know you're all very impressed. Thank you, you're welcome. So we can ask, the, you, for example, we could ask the question, how many heads would it take of flipping a coin for me to wonder if, hey, something is amiss. This isn't a this isn't a regular quarter. This is this is somehow a weighted or rigged or some kind of magic quarter or trick quarter or something. So statistics can help us with that. So a null hypothesis, remember, is that um, there is no difference. So in the case of flipping the coin, that in that scenario, the null hypothesis would be this is a regular coin. There's nothing funky about it. We have our, our null hypothesis where there is no difference. The alternative, um, and, we, and we sometimes call that H naught, the null hypothesis. The alternative H A is that um, it's different. It's not regular. Doesn't say that it's heavier on the heads or heavier on the tails or whatever, but it just says it's it's not behaving uh, quote unquote normally. And so we default. And so what we try to do is we try to reject. Uh, our null hypothesis, right? So we default to assuming that our null hypothesis is correct until we find evidence to the contrary. And if we find evidence to the contrary, we accept the alternative. And usually that's that there is a difference, that, 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 that A is, is, is different, statistically speaking, objectively speaking, from B. And I so- have a, I have a question, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you're gonna be like, wow, you don't know this already? No, no, but, no, 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 please um, ask. Okay, I always get, or I'm always curious, like, can you make, you know, like the quarter is fake, the null hypothesis and like, you know, switch them? Uh, theoretically, you could, but that's not, that's not our traditional approach. So our traditional approach is saying that, so, and this has to do with noise. This has to do with noise. So um, if we had, let's see, what would an example be? If we were making like the mirrors for the new uh, space telescope, the, the Webb Space Telescope we just launched into space, right? Each of those mirrors took, I, I forget, Dan might know, like, like 12 mirrors. Each mirror took something like 18 months to make. And people are extremely precisely measuring the thickness of yeah, that. Yeah, they built this really cool facility under the stadium in Arizona. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah, it's super awesome. If you guys haven't read about it, it's an awesome sort of, we need a distraction, read about this uh, incredible feat of engineering. Um, but it was, it's, you know, years you know, they, they built a like Dan is they built a kiln to melt this glass and then to slowly let it cool over, I don't know, 18 months, whatever it was. And they're extremely precisely measuring that, right? So they're very, very into knowing what the, how thick the surface of this reflective um, part of the telescope is, right? Hundreds of people, tens of thousands of hours time in that. 
that's not what most of we of what we do as scientists is right we have a day to go sample the insects right we have a trip to go measure santa cruz island or something of that nature one two we don't we don't do physics here right? We do biology, biology, ecology. This stuff is more noisy. There's more, there's predators here and there's rain over there. And so all of our samples are, are not by definition, but by experience, they're, they're, they tend to be very noisy. And so we try to err on the side of being conservative. So because we err on the side of being conservative, um, uh, there's, there's, um, uh, we, we, we understand that sometimes we can't always know. And so we're gonna therefore assume that there is no difference. We're, we're gonna be conservative and assume that there is not an effect when there might be a very subtle effect. We wanna make sure that when we say there is an effect, that indeed there really is a, a, an effect of the rain, climate change, whatever. Am I making sense or am I just rambling? Michelle, does that, does that make sense or not really? It was a bit of a ramble. <laughs> okay, let me go a little bit more and see if it makes sense when I go a little bit more. Can we try that? Okay. Okay, so, um, so I, just, I just said we're flipping the coin. And the question is, is the coin a uh, quote unquote regular coin or some kind of, you know, messed with, futz with coin? That question is really no different um, in, con in concept from saying, do these two grasslands differ in species richness? Or to say, does this, do these fish grow better in this part of the ocean versus that part of the ocean? Or are people more supportive of this policy measure than against the policy measure? What we're doing in all these cases is looking at these two populations, populations of the you know, coin flips of, of of uh, fish on a, in a reserve or what have you. And we're essentially asking, do they differ from one another? And the null hypothesis, they do not differ. And so, and so if we don't find evidence that they positively do differ, we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna assume that, that, that there's no effect of, of this variable. Michelle, I'll, 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 I'll just, I'll, I'll weigh in on your, answer a little bit and the the challenge to a non rambly answer is that one of the reasons why it's it sort of works this way is based on like some really interesting philosophy about science uh, and it goes back to Karl Popper and this idea of of, of falsification um, and um, at like a really fundamental level like we're not trying to um prove truths we're trying to disprove falsehoods right we we're, we chip away in search of the truth by eliminating the things that are not true um and so the idea of sort of the way that you phrase your null versus your alternative hypotheses um it's it's a it's a, a philosophical homage to, to this idea that if you buy into the universe where there is some objective truth, like we're not, we're not proving that truth, but because we can't, we can't get to it. But what we're doing along the way is we're picking those things that, that may not be true and, and, and determining that. So you, you chip away at truth by eliminating falsehood and sort of this, this null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis setup is kind of like on, 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 on paper or, or you know, in, in your stats program, like that, that's how it actually works in our individual sort of processes. Um, and so this is, that was, that was basically a, a pretty rambly tease on a conversation <laughs> that we could literally start talking about now and not end for years or ever which is kind of why science and the philosophy of science are actually cool i can recommend some reading um if you're into that um i i'll, I'll tell you it's worth getting into it's really interesting stuff but um uh, I, I will say that um so dan's right it, it's a it's a philosophical approach to 
the world and, and knowledge attainment, I would say it's pretty powerful, not with everything, not with figuring out if God exists and things of that nature, but for much of our natural world, it's proved a very, this approach of, of trying to falsify the null hypothesis has turned out to be a very efficient way to move forward in terms it, of- it, it, mean, it, is, it is effectively responsible for every technology and everything that we know and understand about how the universe works, right? Like, it is, is it, it is, it might seem weird and wonky, but it is an extraordinarily effective set of tools. And it it's, is, it's it effective. Is, it's it is directly because of them that like we, we have what we have as a species. So, okay. so let's, let's look at this and see if this helps, Michelle, see if this helps make sense. Well, I understand it's, it's effectiveness. I was just curious, like, can you make the null hypothesis, you know, like for example, the null being two grasslands differ in their species richness. What if you make the null hypothesis no. two grasslands are the no. same? Like no. that so I'll, matters. I'll show you why. I'll show you why in a second right here. Okay. So watch. So um so uh whatever our thing is, um critters in a grassland, uh how many, how many uh I don't know the price of tuna in your seafood database, you know, whatever, whatever the deal is. Um, we're going to have some, we, me we take a measure of something, we ask people their opinion, are you, are you sort of supportive, kind of support, whatever. There's going to be some distribution. Not everybody is going to be the same. Not every sample we take is going to be identical to every other sample. And so there's some variation, there's some noise, right? And um, in, in ecological systems, environmental systems, we tend to have more noise than some other systems. Um, and that's just sort of the, the beauty and the wonder and the awesomeness of our natural world, but it makes some of this statistic stuff a little more challenging. Regardless, we have, when we think of any population, any, any series of measurements, we, if, if this is a normal distribution, this is the bell curve type stuff, and that, that's another conversation, but let's just assume that it is, a lot of things are. Um, uh, we have some measure of the middleness or the central tendency, you might recognize that as the mean, the average. Uh, and then we have some measure of the spread or some measure of the noise or how variable things are. And we can call that uh, dispersion. You might call that uh, variance or standard error or coefficient of variation. These are all just different uh, ways of, a pro of getting at this idea of central tendency and dispersion. And yeah, okay, I just emphasize that again. Okay, so one of the first simplest tests we can do if we're trying to compare population one to population two is we could say, hey, we got some kelp bass. Uh, we, we caught a bunch of kelp bass here and we caught a bunch of barred sand bass. Are they different? In, do, they, do they differ in size? And again, following on, on Michelle's question, the null hypothesis, they're not different. No, the, the average uh, uh, length of a kelp bass is the same as the average length of a sand bass. Okay, so we do we go out and we measure a bunch of measure, measure catch a bunch of fish, measure a bunch of these fish, right? Um, and, uh, and 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 check them out. So one of the simplest things is to use a t-test, which if we're just comparing two populations, and so this is what we're doing uh, visually. This is what we're doing when we're when we're testing this. So we have some distribution of one of the fish species in terms of size, right? Maybe this is size down here, let's say, and this is number of individuals that are that size. Um, and then we have some other uh, measure of the other uh, uh, species of fish. The difference in these peaks, we could talk about the difference in signal. The amount of overlap, the amount of flop, the amount of, of falling into your neighbor's territory, that's noise. And so what we're doing mathematically is we can take some of these, these properties, such as the average standard deviation and the sample size, and we can throw them into a formula, which no one will remember. And it's okay, we don't, you know, don't worry about it. You can look it up or- I don't remember that or, formula. Or, or you can throw it in your program, but, but this is what it's doing. And what, what it's actually doing is saying, looking at the different, it's saying, looking at the difference here and the difference down here. Right, so it's going to look at the signal to the noise, and you plug numbers in, and some stuff comes out, and you get a number. Okay, 
And so in this case, this is a t-test. This is the t-statistic. And um, and so and so we we would go and we would uh, there's there's when I went to school we had to look these up in books before before we had all these computer things right I'm so old I, I don't even know if Dan had those books but but so basically so basically here's the distribution this is not the distribution of uh, size of fish right this is something else this is the statistical distribution of that t statistic thing right so note that zero it goes from zero and it goes less than zero and above zero, right? A certain, number, a certain number of degrees of freedom which has to do with sample size, but we'll leave that aside for a second. And, and so we say, hey, we looked at our, our, our T statistic and our, what the hell happened there? Our T statistic said it was seven something. It was way over here. It was very far out. So, so what, what our, our mathematics friends that have helped calculate these, these distributions for us tell us is that, oh my God, Anything is possible. Anything is possible in the world, right? But, uh, but it's super, super unheard of, right? Like, like, like the likelihood that this would happen by chance is super rare. And so we'd say, uh, and you can do that in Excel by typing this in. You can put SPSS and there's different ways to do it in your things. But so basically we, we can look at a two-tailed or one-tailed test. Essentially, we're just asking, are we different? And we use, a, a, by convention, this is another thing, Michelle would say, why do we use 0.05? Because we use 0.05 is the answer. There's no real reason. It's just by convention, which means folks just decided to get, start using it. So in other words, we say the chance, the chance that we would get this number or whatever the number is due to purely random chance, meaning there really wasn't an underlying ecological or environmental reason why they were different. It just just threw the dice and random luck of the draw, right? We want that random luck of the draw to be playing a role very rarely. And so by convention, our, our notion for that is 0.05. And this is the so-called p-value that you guys will all remember, right? So we might use a t-test, ANOVA, different tests, but most of them will generate a p-value. And the p-value is the probability so the P stands for probability. This is going to happen just compared, com, uh, just due to purely random reasons. So we've decided that that having only a, that that can happen by chance only five percent of the time. In other words, ninety-five percent of the time that would only happen when there's a real difference. Why didn't we set it one percent of the time? Why didn't we send it 10% of the time? We picked, so we had to pick something, decided on five. Different researchers in different contexts might shift the p-value. And so you might hear the term biologically significant. So maybe we do this and we find out that we have a p-value of point, p equals 0 0.06, right? Statistically, if we use this criteria, say, mm, that's not statistically significant, but you know, we might well think that that's pretty robust, right? If we were studying hurricanes, let's say, where we don't have a lot of sample size, it's hard to get, hard to get, I don't know, caterpillars impacted by hurricanes in your sample size. Um, uh, we might argue this is biologically significant or socially significant or something, but it's not statistically significant. That convention is P equals 0.05. And I'd say an important thing that goes along with that convention um, and the, 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 the threshold is some of you'll see referred to as the alpha, right? Like what, what is your alpha? And so 0.05 is the, the conventional alpha, one in 20. Um, uh, but the other really important convention is you have to sort of think about your research context and decide in advance. It's sort of bad form to do your work thinking 0.05 and then get 0.06 and say, you know what? Point one is good enough, right? So that, that consideration should be considered upon in advance. Totally. So t-test, population one, population two, are they the same, are they different, right? Same idea with a an so-called analysis of variance. It's just here, Instead of looking at one thing to another thing, we're looking at one thing to possibly multiple other things. So several groups, for example, but it's the same basic idea. 
You can do it in Excel, you can do it in XPSS, et cetera. Um, and we can go on and, and, and spend more time and we're happy to talk about different statistical tests that you guys will need with your particular data sets. But that general approach of like sort of a T-test or, a, or, a, or a, an analysis of variance, that's gonna be most of the kind of things you guys, um, most of your data sets that you're gonna wanna test. Um, uh, just real simple, a regression is just an analysis of variance. Um, that, that might sound confusing, but it's the same underlying math. Okay, before we, before we go on and talk about the last few kind of ideas to make sure we have in our head, um, uh, what was clear from talking to so several of you uh, folks uh, last couple of weeks is um, it's, it's important before we jump fully into our, our hardcore analysis, let's start with some pre-statistics. Let's start with some big picture things, right? So before we start drilling down super deep, make sure you're doing your initial characterization. This would be the material, say, in the first paragraph of your results section, where you would outline the big picture, right, before you start getting into the, the specific hypotheses you're testing. And in fact, there, 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 is no, there is no hypothesis testing in this first set. The first question is, just, what's your sample size? How many pieces of microplastics did you uh, count? How many uh, uh, grabs of beach sand did you grab to generate those microplastics? How many people did you survey? That type of stuff. So one is, what's your sample size? And this, what, what, what Dr. is setting up right here, this is actually totally relevant and important information to share as part of your results section. So yep. this isn't just arbitrary overview of statistics. This is, you could also be hearing this as instructions for what to do next in your capstone. <laughs> Excellent. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Uh, so yeah, okay. So first is how many things we talk about? How many how many elements are there? Next, what's the what's the range? So what's the biggest big thing we had? What's the smallest small thing we had? Right? What's the largest percentage of people that said that? What's the fewest percentage of people? What's the highest price? What's the lowest price? That kind of stuff. And then some measure of typicalness, right? Again, we're not getting into the statistics and checking all the, the fine scale. This is big picture, right? Big picture. So overall, if we just threw all of our samples into, into one big column and averaged them, what's the central tendency over there? What's the dispersion? And so on and so forth. And then I would take those and compile them in a little table, right? Or not a little, it could be a big table, depends on what our stuff is, but that will help us understand. Um, and then if there's any large breakdowns, I would repeat that for some of the large breakdowns. So for example, we might do this for all of our data. And then maybe we have data from year one, year two, year three. I would go back and redo that for year one and redo that for year two and year three, right? And then we'll have this big picture that we can um, articulate. And by putting it into a table, that's a perfect thing to put in your results section, but it's also the kind of thing you can go back and refer to. This will also help us with the sniff tests. Sometimes we get so down in the weeds, we start graph. I, I had a student in one of my, um, one of my um, exercises in one of my, my other class um, did something and it, it just didn't make sense. And um, this student didn't, didn't have the sniff test. And so she just generated the graph and here's my figure. And it's like, eh, you really should have thought about that because if you gave it 10 seconds of thought, that wouldn't have made any sense. By going through this sort of big picture exercise, that will, that will make sure that we're not um, accidentally going down some rabbit hole and going to some strange place that doesn't make sense. Um, so here we go. Here's an example. There's another, I, I tried to find another Olympic example that um, uh, real quickly this afternoon for you guys. So this might be, hey, our, uh, tell me about the, the, the sizes of different Olympians, right? So uh, here's some data. And so this, is, this isn't all the data, right? But this, this is a subset of data. Maybe this is the max and min. How about uh, the shortest? men, the shortest women, et cetera. So we can have that in some kind of table. And then we can visualize that here. So we can show the distribution of all the athletes versus some of the skiers versus the bobsledders, et cetera, right? Again, there's no statistics involved here. This is just describing the overall big picture. But now that I have these things, my table, my initial, initial uh, figures, I can set those aside and keep those here. And that'll help me That'll help me uh, get a sense of what's going on. And then as we move into doing the statistics, we can start to think about um, uh, you know, what makes sense. For example, both of these, just eyeballing it, th these, these folks look generally speaking like they're mostly normally distributed populations. So we can use some parametric tests and things of that nature and, and so on and so forth. 
uh, a, little, a few more uh, terms that I just wanted to wrap up with. Uh, and sorry, any any questions about that part so far? I'm just going to end up with some some concept uh, reminders. Is making sense to folks? Ringing familiar vaguely? No. Okay. Great. Perfect. I'm surprised they're not all examples from the NFL. I'm just saying. I was trying to be more diverse, damn right. But I was trying to be respectful that not everybody likes football. I'm trying to be helpful and topical. You see, I'm, really I'm topical. Into biathlon. Topical. topical top. I love biathlon, but that's another story. Okay. So, um, statistics terminology. So, uh, and this is again something in speaking with my students the last couple of weeks, this wasn't always, um, uh, it, it would be helpful if you guys gave a few minutes thought to these terms. So, one is the population. This is the group of items that we're looking at. So, it's going to depend on your study. It could be could be all kelp bass, like if we're talking about the ecological definition of, you know, kelp bass in, in the West Coast or something like that. But um, usually with your type of with our types of studies here, it would be the kelp bass at our particular sampling site, right? We're going to sample this group and ask, hey, how big are these fish? As compared to a census, a census would be a complete enumeration of every unit in the in in the area so for example if we were censusing if we're using the term correctly if we're censusing the trees in the forest in this in or if we were censusing the trees on campus on the csuci campus let me say it that way that would mean someone walked and checked every single tree right so we didn't subsample we didn't sample 10 and then try to extrapolate we actually counted everyone that's mostly not what we're doing um, mostly we are sampling, okay? So mostly we are, we are not doing a census. We're taking a subset of the trees and trying to extrapolate something about all the trees and, of the, on the CSUCI campus. And so again, pop, the population would be, let's say the fish on this particular beach. The attribute maybe that you guys are measuring for your capstone might be the size of this fish. And what, and what we're doing is instead of we, we want to know about all I know it's mind blowing I know take it in people let me just I'll just do it again I'll just do it again I'll just do it again ready ready breathe breathe yeah see people it's multimedia that's how hot I am I'm TikToking or whatever you guys call Straight it out of 1995 yes I'm TikToking so um so what we're doing is we want to know about all these individuals on the left right or actually sorry we want to know about all of these individuals but we don't have the time we don't have the money we don't have the logistical support to do that so we've sucked out these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, there are about 25 of them. And we're gonna measure these individuals and, and assume if we, if we randomly sampled and if we, if we got a representative sample that they will match, let's say the size distribution of the overall uh, population. And so we're taking that sample and we're trying to infer something about the population. Uh, related to this, this idea of accuracy and precision, this isn't super important for the figures you're making, but it is something you want to think about when you get to your discussion. As a reminder, um, uh, we, we oftentimes confuse these terms, right? So we can be, uh, accuracy can be high or low. And this is the analogy in all the statistical textbook is this. So it's a, it's a, it's a you know, target practice. We're shooting our arrows and we're trying to get in the bullseye in the center, okay? If we get in the center, um, that, is accurate that be reality if we have uh, if our samples are coming back with precision with high precision that means it might might be accurate might, might be not accurate but they're all going to be pretty similar to one another and so th those two things might when, when you start to get some different results or try to interpret stuff you might think about either of those uh uh, uh axes so was I accurate? Was I not accurate? Was I, were my results tightly grouped together? Were they more spread away from one another? Um, and, uh, and obviously the best is to be highly precise and highly accurate. That's what we all want, right? Um, but um, we rarely do we get that. And so we sometimes have to think about uh, uh, the consequence for that. And again, that's mostly for your discussion section, but I just introduced that. Um, and, and the key thing here for all this is, is we assume that our samples are representative. When you guys surveyed, when we went to our markets to survey for seafood, when we drove on our roads and counted roadkill, when we encountered our surfers and, 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 and people on the beach and we asked them questions, we're assuming that those 100 people, 100 fish, whatever, 
um, are representative, are, 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 there's no bias in there. And so that's what we hope doesn't always happen. I don't, I don't remember what I did it again. I don't know why I was doing this, but it was apparently very important. Okay, so I'm gonna finish off with this idea of independence. Okay, so this is something that, that's come up several times. For the first general overview uh, summary statistics, don't so much need it. But once we leave that and begin to go into the rigorous um, uh, uh, figure generation and hypothesis testing, we do need to spend some time and think about this. And so the question is, what is a replicate? What, what, what is independent? So here's some guys that went and, and stuck a net in the water and they pulled up a bunch of fish. So what's the sampling unit here? Is the sampling unit fish one, and then the next one, fish two, and then fish three? Or is the sampling unit all the fish that are in this, in this net? So it's gonna depend. It's gonna depend a little bit on what we're, what we're actually, um, uh, what our study is. But depending on, on our study, the fish could be the sampling replicate, or that net could be one replicate. Even though we have multiple measures, that could be a single, uh, a, a, a single replicate. And again, the question gets to be how independent are these uh, 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 data grabs from one another? And so I'll, I'll finish with this last image here. So here's, here's a, a mental experiment. So we have a bunch of fish and we wanna add some mercury in the water and see if that hurts the fish or, or affects how they grow. So here's my experiment. Here's a bunch of buckets. Here's a bunch of fish in buckets. And then in, in half of the buckets, I gave some extra mercury. And in the other halves of the buckets, I didn't give any extra mercury or just, I used a control or, or whatever it was. So we have 10 buckets, there's five fish in each bucket, and we have with mercury or without mercury. And we're looking at the, and we measured the fish to start with, and then at some point in the future, we measured them to see, see how much they grew. So you guys tell me, what's the sample size here of this, of, of this capstone experiment? Somebody unmute and, and give me your thoughts. Oh no. Do we have to call on someone? Would uh, it be 50 fish? Uh, okay, so, so, so good guess. So what, what's the hypothesis we're testing, Dorian? What, what, what's the main question you think, the, the most important question we wanna ask? Whether or not mercury affects the fish growing, so yeah. Yeah, right, good. So, um, so the process that we're gonna, essentially the statistical approach that we're gonna go through is, uh, again, we always want as big a sample size as we can. The larger the sample size, the more power we have to detect small differences. So if we had a choice of doing an experiment with 100 fish or 10 fish, 100 fish would be better, right? If we had the money and the resources to do that, that experiment on 300 fish, we'd probably wanna do 300 fish, right? So whenever we can, we wanna go bigger. So if we have 10 fish, in five buckets each of two treatments, right? Um, that's 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 a hundred, that's a hundred fish. So that so that's a lot of fish. Um, clearly, one of the things is mercury, no mercury. Okay, so now we're down to fifty. So there's fifty fish in a mercury bucket and fifty or, or or in the mer mercury exposure, and fifty not in the mercury exposure. Right? It would be great if we can just say that. It would be great if we could say, hey. An N of 50 compared to an N of 50. But we don't know if that's the case. So maybe there is something about this, about this um, bucket. Call it a beach, call it a restaurant, call it a call it a, a roadway, right? Whatever it is, whatever, whatever our whatever that conceptual bucket is, maybe there's something about this bucket that makes these fit, these five fish behave more similarly than five totally random fish, right? And so essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna statistically put all of these different combinations in and see, is there no difference? Is, is there no effect of bucket, for example? If there is an effect of bucket, ah, man, th then our replicate is an N of five. We're going to compare one to two, three, four. We're going to compare one, two, three, four, five to one, two, three, four, five. 
If, however, it turns out that we do that statistic, that first part of the statistical test, and it turns out that, oh no, it, it's actually, there is no effect. I, I can't, these five don't seem to be growing any differently than these five, than these five, or these five, or these five. And if that's the case, then, then intellectually we can say, okay, there's no effect of bucket. So we can pretend as if all 50 were together. And then we can rerun the test slightly tweaked, dropping out the bucket part of the, of the math and saying, hey, uh, let's compare the, the, the 50 with the mercury to the 50 without. And we'll have, a, we'll have a greater ability to detect finer scale differences in growth. And so that approach is the one we should take. So when we're starting to first generate our stuff, we should keep things binned, keep the beaches together, keep the years together, all that kind of stuff. And then as we go through sequentially, we'll say, hey, is it okay to merge all the years? I don't know. I'm not going to make the call in my head. I'm going to use statistics to tell me if they're independent or not to, to, to test the null hypothesis. No effect of bucket? Cool. Then I can lump them together and we can proceed on down the road that way. Does that make sense? So our final maybe takeaway graph could be one bar that says average fish growth with, with mercury and the other bar average fish, fish growth without mercury. And that would be cool. But that wouldn't be our very first bar we'd lead with, our very first visualization, excuse me, we'd lead with, right? We'd lead with the more complicated parts. So that, that's a little bit of an intro to stuff. Uh, yeah, okay, I already asked that. So, so there we go. So then in, in summary, wait, we so about someone wanted to hop, chime in. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. No, Michaela. I, um, so independence is, you were saying just, I, I guess I'm kind of confused then what independence is, what you just described. So, so right. So what we, so what we, we want is we want to make sure that, that each of these 25 fish are as different as these 500, as, as one random fish is from one of the other random 500 fish. That would be independent. If instead, may, may, maybe, maybe you and I are crappy fisher people, and maybe we, we only are good at catching the old slow fish. So maybe these 25 fish we caught skew older or skew slower, right? In which case, those, those 25 fish that we had, it's a, it's a sample, it's, it's cool, it's science, it's good, we got that. But um, those 25 fish are more similar to each other. In other words, you know, the noise is, is less wide. The, the, the... Yeah, so you're saying that like um, the this, sample this that we're looking tighter. at. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so the sample that we're looking at, we wanna make sure it's a good representative of the whole population. Right. Right. And that's why you want to do the statistics test to determine that before you do further. Uh, it was, it was, it was, yeah. So I'll say it's not that you want it to be a good representative of the whole population, but you want to make sure that the measurement you're making is not dependent on something else something that maybe else. you okay, do yeah. or do not know about. Okay. Not biased. Okay. That makes not sense. systematically biased by something that you're not accounting for. Okay. Does that make sense? Like another example, yeah. like say you're, you're there's, you know, say that when the fish are smaller, they like bait A, and when they're bigger, they like bait B. And you don't know that, you only fish with bait B, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a sample that's representative of only those. the fish who like bait B, right? So okay. you're, you are not going to be independent of the, of, the, of, the, of the full population. You're gonna be dependent on this other thing, which is this bait selection bias. So the okay. classic thing that'll happen in a capstone type of experiment is so we may, maybe these are the the number of microplastics in each of these buckets or something right or, or whatever and so there's like oh we found 35 here and found 20 here you know whatever the case is the classic thing is i would go look at a student's figure and it'd be a, an average of like you know the, the first opening salvo figure is like an average of 500 pieces of plastic and it was like whoa 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 right hold on a second how do we know that these were all you know um, that it was okay to combine these. How do we know that, 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 that these weren't overly small and these weren't overly big or whatever? So your default, sometimes our default uh, uh, thing we do when we're, when we're generating some initial figures is just to merge everything together. 
And I said that was okay when you're just getting the big picture in terms of the max and min and that kind of stuff. But once we trans start transitioning to quantitative figures, you can't just throw everything together like that, right? We, we, need, we need to put some time into thinking about it. And then let's, let's go through the mental rigor of saying, hey, is it, is it legit to merge all these pieces of plastic together or should I keep them structured in the beaches, in the sample replicate, in the day, whatever it is that I, that I sampled them from? Cool, does that make sense, Michaela? Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Is, is this making sense, you guys, or is this conceptually confusing or? Okay. So again, we talked statistics probability, same thing, sort of flip side of, of, a, of a literal uh, statistical coin. Um, and the key thing is our statistics are gonna allow us to test hypotheses. Just because you make a figure, that doesn't necessarily mean you tested a hypothesis. The figure is gonna start us off, then we're gonna apply the math, and then we might go and revise the figure kind of thing, okay? We're gonna describe our, we can describe our populations different ways. Typically though, we use a measure of central tendency and a measure of the dispersion or spread. Key to this is what is a replicate? Uh, I'd say the most common tests that, that you all probably will do will be t-tests and analysis of variance slash regression. And then uh, let's all start out before we get too far down this statistical thinking, let's start with getting those summary stats together so that you have an understanding. And when, when Dr. Reinemann or I or your reviewer comes and takes, uh, and takes a look at your, um, your figure, they'll have a sense of, oh, okay, I, I, I see, I, I get the big picture. Again, uh, it's very easy that since you've all been thinking about your wildfire, your roadkill, your surfers no, no health, all that stuff for months and months and months and months, it's super easy for us to just assume everybody gets it. Most people coming to your data have no idea. They have no idea how many things you measured. They have no idea how many sites you, you visited. No idea. So that summary stats is the way that you, you can quantitatively begin to onboard them before you go into more, a more rigorous articulation of, of your results. Four o'clock on the money. Um, let's take a 10 minute break. If folks with um, pressing statistical questions, which is all of you, uh, 